On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, it's the March 8th, 2022 edition of What The Ship, Top 5 Maritime Stories. I'm your host, Sal McCoglano. Welcome to this episode of What The Ship. So this week, again, five stories covering the basis of a lot of information in the maritime sector. Uh, some tragedy, obviously, with the war going on in Russia, Ukraine, some issues about escalating freight costs, particularly regarding inflation for those of you at home, some scandal and some reasons why you should never play chicken with a large container ship. So let's go ahead and jump into story number one. So story number one has to be the ongoing issue in the war between Russia and Ukraine. Over a week now, and Ukrainian forces are under an onslaught by the Russians. A lot of issues have been made about Russian logistics in the war. I just did a spot and I'll have it in the show notes with Freight Waves talking about this issue. Uh, the issue I would be everyone to be careful of is while yes, Russian logistics doesn't appear to be doing well, the Russians don't seem to be doing very well, they're still steamrolling their way through Ukraine, maybe taking them longer than they thought. There's a lot of issues with them getting in there but they're still pushing the Ukrainians back and the Russians have a lot more resources than they've brought to bear so far. They're saving a lot of their weaponry, a lot of their forces for a potential NATO uh, involvement. So they have a lot more going on here, but let's go ahead and talk about several issues that we have here. So first story right here, how, Russia, uh, how market forces are choking off Russian ports. So we hear a lot about sanctions, a lot about government sanctions. However, the big impact has been self-sanctioning, companies shutting Russia off from the outside. And this is the companies acting themselves, the big container liners, Maersk, Hophog, CMA, CGM, uh, uh, you name it, they're all out there doing it. The, the one exception I would argue is Costco, obviously. Costco, the Chinese overseas shipping company, hasn't do it, but MSC, all of them are doing it. And uh, this story uh, with information from Windward out of Israel is showing the indication on how the Russian ports are slowing down, the, the amount of trade coming into them. Uh, this story also here on G-Captain, this is from John Conrad talking about the maritime blockade of Ukraine. Uh, this is the Russian attempt to shut Ukraine off from the outside world, and it's very effective. There are no vessels coming in and out of Ukraine. I would also argue it, it's actually playing both ways. Here we are on marine traffic. The Sea of Azov is still denuded of any vessels whatsoever. As long as the Ukrainians hold Mariupol and they have artillery and rocket uh, here, they can control the straits. There was just a report today that a Ukrainian missile battery, uh, potentially a multiple launch rocket system, actually hit and damaged a Russian patrol boat off of Odessa. First time we've ever seen that with a multiple launch rocket system. Uh, we know that two vessels were hit from Mariupol at the very beginning of the war. This has caused vessels to pile up here at the Kerch Strait at Rostov, meaning vessels are not moving on the Sea of Azov. On the flip side, Ukrainian vessels and vessels in Ukraine aren't moving over here in the, in, in the uh, Gulf around Odessa. Keep hearing reports of Russian vessels, potential amphibious assault. We know that once the Russian forces from Crimea link up with the forces out of the Donbass, they're turning this way. They've seized the port of Kyrgyzstan, which is right here. We know they've seized Kyrgyzstan right here. There were attacks on uh, uh, Mikolev down here. This is where a vessel was hit. I'll talk about here in a second. Uh, there's a major bridge right here at Mikolev. If they get across this bridge, they're heading toward Odessa. And this is having impacts across the board. Uh, again, story from G Captain about ship insurers extended war risk closer to Romania. Uh, a story that John and I talk about a lot, John Conrad, is the lack of really NATO presence up on the Black Sea. I don't expect NATO to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Russians in the Black Sea. However, there is Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey, three NATO nations, along with Georgia, an ally, that you know basically is, is encountering a war on the Black Sea without a big presence on there. However, the things we're starting to see here are insurance companies, particularly the underwriters, are starting to refuse coverage in this area for good reasons. Now, Ukraine, obviously, they're not going to ensure going to Ukraine is impossible to get in there. But if the Black Sea coverage increases, potentially uh, encompassing the port here of Novorosk, 
which is down here, the very southern uh, uh, part here of, uh, of uh, the Black Sea, well, not southern part, but mid-range here. This is that large tanker port right here that's coming out. You see the tankers coming out here. That's going to have an impact. Most insurance rates are probably about 0.125% of a ship's hull. You're seeing insurance rates in the upper Black Sea of 5 to 8%. And if this starts spreading down here, that gets going to be a problem. As Ukraine evacuates trapped mariners, foreign mariners count cost of the war. This is the hit on the MV Bangalore Samrididi. Uh, this vessel was hit in the bridge. You can see it's smoking from there. We found out from reports from the repatriated crew that most of the crew was up on the bridge at the time when this missile hit. Uh, it killed a third assistant engineer, wounded others. This crew has been evacuated. Many ship's crews are now being evacuated, meaning these vessels are being abandoned. Uh, there's no personnel. And that, that correlates with the fact that the AIS transponders are turning off for many of these vessels, that the vessels are being abandoned, and which means they're going to be write-offs uh, entirely unless they can get in and salvage them later on. Story right here from Lloyd's List, shipping hurt by Ukrainian conflict amid record volatility on the commodities market. So uh, BIMCO, uh, which is a uh, shipping association, is talking about these uh, inflationary pressures uh, from higher prices uh, from the operations and issues on uh, inflation and demand for tankers and bulk carriers, despite what's called any ton mile boost. So you're not just hauling, this is a measurement of hauling a ton of cargo over one mile. And as you route vessels longer distances to go get them, you're increasing the ton mileage. And that's a, that's a big issue. That's a big issue being done. Uh, this story over on Freight Waves kind of builds on it, how invasion of Ukraine could ease shipping logjam off U.S. ports. Uh, Greg Miller, again, talked with BIMCO, particularly talked with Niels Rasmussen, who used to be at Maersk. Now he is a, a chief analyst over at BIMCO. Uh, and he contends that the Russians' invasion of Ukraine will be bad for shipping demand. I don't know about that yet. I, I'm, I'm really mixed on this. Uh, and just to show you I'm mixed on this, this story on, um, on uh, G-Captain, Ukraine uncertainties caused divergent views for shipping market. Barry Parker talks this very story, he beat me to the punch on writing this story, because there you can find stories that say this is going to be great for shipping, war is always a plus up for, for shipping, whereas others are saying this is going to be bad for shipping. You watch the stock market over the past couple of days, it dropped terribly. I mean, just, just off a cliff drop, but shipping stocks are up. And so there's a lot of variability here that's going on. So how this plays out is not exactly clear. What we do know is that right now the fighting in Ukraine is destroying that 10% of world grain that we count on to provide food for Africa, Middle East, and Asia, which means that food's got to come from someplace else. And as long as we continue this, this self-sanctioning and sanctioning of Russia by companies and governments, that means we're shutting out the Russians. So one of the interesting statistics is Russia handles about 3% of the world's containers, which you know, if you lose 3% of the world's containers, it doesn't sound like a lot. You know, if, you know, container markets or world shipping goes up a couple of percent every year. But this is 3% in a week. And it's not just 3%. All the goods that were heading to Russia and Ukraine are onboard vessels or even being loaded on vessels. Now they got to be offloaded, which means they got to be offloaded in the ports before they arrive at Ukraine and Russia, which means they're going to clog up the yards. Those containers that were coming out of Ukraine and Russia were going to be put back into circulation to move other cargo. They're out. Uh, this has ramifications across the whole global supply chain. And what we're doing is throwing more kinks in a global supply chain that is full of kinks. I didn't talk about Hong Kong and the rise of, of COVID. I uh, didn't talk about the impending labor renegotiations on the West Coast. There are so many variables out here that are throwing kinks in this that I don't think you can sit there and say that global demand and peaks are coming down. This is a mess. This is a mess, and the war in Russia and Ukraine is just adding to it. All right, let's go to our second story. Story number two looks at how the world's reacting to this and how commodities and freight are adjusting to this. So this story, a Bloomberg story on G-Captain, ship sale for South Africa coal after Russian sanctions. So we've been talking a long time about U.S. LNG filling the gap for Russian LNG. Well, here you see coal. Uh, ships are heading to South Africa to load up on coal. China had been diversifying its resources quite a bit. We've seen this in the lead up to 
Russia, Ukraine, and even COVID, China in their Belt and Road Initiative have been really kind of diversifying, trying to make sure they have multiple sources for, for commodities, uh, whether it's ore or grain or oil or fuel, you name it. And so here we're seeing that being done right now. Coal is going to be shifting. Coal is going to be great for the United States. Uh, coal exports are going to go through the roof right now. We see bulkers lined up in the Chesapeake Bay waiting to get into the coal terminals in Virginia and Maryland, uh, waiting to offload. Uh, and we're going to see the same thing across the board. Uh, this is down here at the Richards Bay Coal Terminal down in South Africa. And so we're going to see that. Uh, also seeing this story come in, China is shipping stockpiles of metal to Europe. Uh, China had been stockpiling pretty clear. You know, if you don't follow at man integrated Ross Kennedy on Twitter, you really should, uh, because he's been talking about the fact that China has been stockpiling quite a bit. Uh, I noted that when all of a sudden China released LNG shipments to go to Europe, that was unusual. They, they only would do that if they either had an LNG source available to them or they had stockpiled enough that they didn't need the excess capacity. And that's kind of what we're seeing here. Uh, this story talks about the fact that 20,000 tons of aluminum ingot have been exported out of Shanghai's free trade zone in recent weeks and heading to customers in Europe. Again, why would China give up 20,000 tons of aluminum ingot? Money. It, it's cash. I mean, it's huge amounts of money that can be made by selling this. This is why they kept that this ore in their free uh, trade zone area so that they can send this out. Uh, we know China, there was a story earlier this week about China having fleet, a fleet of old tankers off of uh, uh, a port, uh, Qingdao, in northern China near Shandong. Uh, old tankers just loaded with oil, just sitting there, just waiting. Uh, they've been stockpiling a lot of resources. And you can go full conspiracy. This is China planning. This is China preparing for the worst case scenario. And you can sit there and say, well, what's the worst case scenario? Well, we've been living it. I mean, we're living it with COVID. We're living it with a war between two of the largest European states right now. And so China is not far off the idea to have these stockpiles available. And the last story on this one I want to add is this one, Sam Chambers over at Splash 24-7, Daredevil Aframaxes keep Russian oil moving. So Aframax. Uh, Aframax is a size of tanker. It's below the largest size. It's not a very large or ultra large crude carrier. It's, it's roughly about 80 to 120,000 deadweight tons. Uh, it, it's kind of a, a, a short to medium range tanker. Uh, and, and it's not a small uh, specific product tanker. This is kind of that mid-range Goldilocks tanker. And what he writes about here is how some of these shipping companies are taking the risk to go get Russian oil and still load up on it, hoping they'll be able to sell it to somebody. Uh, it's a big risk right now because, again, by the time you get to Russia, load and leave, there may be sanctions in play. Right now, the U.S. has not sanctioned it, although President Biden is coming out this morning, March 8th, to talk about this. We may see a sanction of Russian oil happening in the United States, and I expect we do. Uh, but other countries haven't done it yet. And understand, not all countries are going to sanction Russian oil. The question is, if you do sanction Russian oil, where do you get the replacement for the United States, we need Russian oil because it's heavy oil. We need it for our refineries. We're not, we don't have enough of that oil to put in our refineries. Fracking oil can't go in our refineries. And since we haven't built a refinery since 1977, that's an issue. We can get the oil from other sources, Venezuela, Iran, but we have sanctions against them. Do we alleviate the sanctions to get it? People are going to have to raise questions about what sanctions are out there and what their priorities are. A really interesting series of stories here across the board and how we handle the lockdown of Ukraine and Russia out of the global market. Again, we're seeing sanctions like never before. I tweeted something the other day about how sanctions prior to World War II led the Japanese to really strike in December of 1941. Now, Japan had been planning a war against the West for a long time. But when you initiate sanctions, we sanctioned 99% of their oil imports. We froze their money. We froze iron ore and steel. We basically put Japan in a position of either you accept the sanctions and give up your position in China, or you go to war. They went to war. And my issue with that is I have no problem with sanctions. I have no problem with leveling sanctions, but you better have your deterrence ready to go. The problem is Japan struck in December of 1941. 
the U.S. wasn't planning to have its full deterrence up in the Pacific until the summer of 1942, leaving a six-month gap, which the Japanese struck. All right, that's story number two. Story number three, a president of the United States talked about shipping. Woohoo! Yes, shipping, shipping in the State of the Union address. Thank you, everybody. And it wasn't a maritime disaster either. It wasn't Exxon Valdez. It wasn't some disaster. He actually talked about shipping in terms of the supply crisis. Granted, it was a sentence. And then he went on to talk about nursing homes. But still, we got into the State of the Union. I was happy about that. Uh, the president has come out. This is the story on GCAP and Mike Schuller. President Biden puts ocean carriers in the crosshairs. I just did a video with Lauren Began from Squall Strategies going in detail about this. So uh, that video will be coming out later this week. Please watch it. It's a great video, but I want to include it in What the Ship because I think it's really important that we talk about it. The, the White House has targeted the large ocean carriers, the nine big companies and the three alliances for basically being a cartel. And, and let me be clear, I have an issue with this. Cartel means they're price fixing, means they're setting prices. That's not what they're doing. Uh, he also came out and basically blamed them for the increase in freight rates and, and go from Mike's stories over here to the press release that was uh, put out by the White House. Uh, and the, the title is Lowering Prices and Leveling the Playing Field in Ocean Shipping. Uh, they talk about this. This is the statement they say right here. They increased spot rates for freight shipping between Asia and the United States by 100% since January 2020 and increased rates for freight shipping between the U.S. and Asia by over 1,000% over the same period. All right, hang on a second. Number one, yeah, freight rates going across the Pacific here was you know, $1,500 a container. It is much higher now. So when they sit there and say that, you know, all of a sudden the, the, the freight rate spiked, is it because of them? Well, it's like blaming your gas station for the raids in, in, in fuel prices right now. Is the gas station responsible for it? No. Is, is the company that owns it responsible for it? Well, maybe a little bit. But to sit there and say that the shipping companies are responsible for the freight rates rise is, is a bit much. Now, let me be clear. I have at times been hard on the, on the ocean carriers. I've been hard on the ocean carriers uh, lobby, the World Shipping Council. I've been hard on the president of the World Shipping Council, John Butler. I may have inadvertently compared him to Dr. Evil from the Austin Powers movies. But let me be clear, I, I, I don't think they are solely responsible for the rise in freight rates. But let's be clear, freight rates at a record high. This is the latest report from uh, Freight Waves uh, using uh, the Freightos Baltic Index right here. And when you look at the freight rates just for this year so far, you can see escalation. The, the, US, the Southeast Asia to US East Coast is up from $16,500 to over 18,000. From the uh, Southeast Asia to the West Coast, up from 13.7,000 to 16,000. So freight rates are up, obviously. And again, if you go back and look at these in early 2020, it's talking about $1,500 to $2,500. So yeah, we're seeing huge, massive uh, freight rate increases. However, there's a lot of factors involved in this. There's, you can't identify one, I'm a historian, it drives me crazy when students do this. You can't identify one issue and say, okay, this is the cause for all the problems. And if you remove it, that fixes it. It's what draw with every time travel movie, by the way. It's, you just can't go back and remove one problem and fix everything. It doesn't work that way. And when you look at these stories that are out here, this is a Lodestar story, big ships at the heart of the Westport port congestion. There's a lot of issues at play here. You can't just sit there and tell me this. I mean, the, the backup in the port of LA and Long Beach was systematic. It existed prior to this. Again, I got two videos, which I'll have up here in the show notes that you can look at. One of them talks about, number one, the idea of the big ships and, and the problem they caused. I blame Ben Franklin, the, and not Ben Franklin, the American founding father, but the CMA, CGM Ben Franklin, when they brought her into LA and Long Beach a long time ago, 2015 or so, that was going to be a problem. Everybody talked about it was going to be a problem, and it has been a problem. The other thing was the FMC report that highlighted all these issues. We knew about this. 
And so th there's a lot of issues, systematic problems that are going on. This is just the shipping side. I'm not even talking about the port, the road, the rail, the warehouses, the distribution centers, and you, the Americans, who've got to have everything at a push of a button delivered to you the next day. That's another issue there too. But what we're seeing is some changes being made. And I think the reason he mentioned it, President Biden mentioned it in the speech, is there's two bills going before Congress right now, two versions of an Ocean Reform Act. Uh, the FMC, the Federal Maritime Commission, which I talked about in the video with uh, uh, Lauren Began, we talked about it in a great deal. Uh, Daniel Maffei, uh, the uh, chairman of it, went before the Senate committee to talk about this with Rebecca Dye, another commissioner. And the FMC, basically, according to the story by Sam Chambers, makes a pitch to Senate for greater powers. Uh, they do want greater powers. They, they, they want more power uh, extended to them. And so, sorry, being out in the background. They want more power, but the way they're doing that is through a power sharing agreement between the Federal Maritime Commission, which is an independent agency, not under executive authority, and the Department of Justice, which is under presidential authority. So you're, you're, you're creating a hybrid here, bringing these two entities together. And uh, uh, Maffei at the TPM conference out in Long Beach uh, vowed over his dead body that basically the uh, FMC will maintain its independence. Meanwhile, you get a, a, a story like this. Oops, hang on a second. Let me fix. Meanwhile, you get a story like this from John Gallagher. House panels open up price gouging probe of major ocean carriers. Maersk, CMA, CGM, Hop Hog Glide, targets of congressional watchdogs. So the president has basically thrown chum into the ocean. And we can expect to see uh, House and Senate hearings uh, on this. Uh, you already see this, leaders of the select subcommittee on the coronavirus crisis and the subcommittee on economic and consumer uh, policy, which are all under the Oversight and Reform Committee, sent letters on Wednesday to the heads of Mayor CMA, CGM, Hopog Lloyd, requesting information about container rate increases in reports over the past year on exorbitant fees and surcharges. Let me be clear about something. Number one, I do think the FMC needs more power to oversee and regulate the ocean shipping. Uh, I think that the United States, the EU, and China, through a series of, of, of decisions, basically deregulate and allow the shipping alliances to operate as alliances. Uh, do I think they price set? Not for this situation, I don't. I, I think this was completely market-driven. People wanted their freight, and they were willing to pay exorbitant ra uh, rates to get it here. They were willing to pay money that bumped them in the front of the line. However, I do think that there is, has to be a concern that going forward in the future, that the ocean carriers, which now have a taste of profit, something they haven't had in a long time. Again, you know, the, the, the ocean liners made as much profits last year as they did in the past 10 years combined. That's not saying that they made record profits the past year is, is astronomical. What I would argue is over the past 10 years, they did terrible. They were, they were competing against each other. They were overbuilding, overcapacity. They did everything in their own power to, to run each other out of business, consolidate, and get themselves to the position they're in today. They're not going to want to give this up. There's no way. There's no way that they want to go back to the way things were. Maersk, CMA, CGM, Hop Hop, all those companies have money in their hand. And let me be clear. There's nothing more dangerous than a mariner with money in his pocket. Believe me, he's either going to get in trouble or do something smart and more than likely do something dumb. So I, I don't know what the companies do with this. And I think it's a pretty good idea to start getting the enforcement in. I'm not crazy about the MOU between DOJ and FMC. I believe FMC should be plussed up. I think FMC should be given more power with it. I also think the FMC is an independent agency. We need to start rethinking that. Do we, do, they want to, do we want them to be an independent regulatory agency? Or do we want to repeal the Reorganization Act of 1961 and create a stronger maritime agency with Marriott on one side and the FMC on another, with somebody overhead giving directions? That's my opinion. Uh, not everybody agrees with that. But that's story number three. There's a lot going on uh, with the maritime industry across the board, but this story popped, which I thought was really interesting. Popular U.S. Merchant Marine Academy Admiral Jack Buono resigns. Uh, this is a John Conrad story. Uh, Buono is resigning his position as superintendent of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, ending a maritime career spanning more than 45 years. 
He's a 1978 Kings Point graduate, has spent the past three and a half years at the Academy and will relinquish command at a ceremony in June of 2022 on a date to be determined. His successor has not been announced. He's been there since 2018 after the previous superintendent, uh, James Hellas, was fired by uh, Admiral Busby, the head of Merritt. Uh, Hellas was not very popular. He was a former army officer, a colonel, and he lacked maritime knowledge and maritime connections and it made it difficult to win over the stakeholders. All right, let me, let me be clear about a couple of things. Number one, this is uh, one of was, I think the 13th superintendent and they've been running through them fairly quickly here recently. There is a scandal that just happened that I talked about on this channel involving sexual assault, sexual harassment, the Midshipman X uh, scandal, which is on here. It's talked about in the story. Uh, and I, I think Buono is resigning, but he was also asked to resign. I, I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I don't have evidence about that. No one tells me this, but my indication was they were going to remove him sooner. However, they don't want to leave a gap right now there. And they want to do have time to do an adequate search to find a new superintendent for this. I, I think this story is important on several reasons. Number one, this is the only story we're getting out there about what's happening out of the maritime administration in US maritime sector. That is a huge problem, in my opinion. We're in the middle of a supply chain crisis. The maritime administration's focus has been on this, laser focused on this. There are fundamental issues at play right now in the maritime industry. We're seeing record profits. We're seeing supply chain in the news all the time, fuel crisis going on. There are issues that ocean, uh, that, that uh, Oil companies want Jones Act waivers to bring in foreign tankers to move U.S. oil around when there's U.S. tankers available. OSG, Crowley have tankers available that are ready to go. However, these companies don't want to pay the additional cost to use a U.S. flag tanker while at the same time uh, just take the benefit of a foreign tanker. You just had the Navy announce the closure of the fuel facility at Red Hill in Hawaii, meaning the U.S. is going to lose its primary fuel depot in the Central Pacific as it drains that oil out. Let me be clear, it should have been drained years ago. The fact that that gas has been leaking into people's water, military personnel, civilian personnel is criminal, criminal in my opinion. We had the same thing happen in North Carolina at Camp Lejeune. Uh, DOD does a terrible job of maintaining its infrastructure. But to close that facility means you're going to lose 450 million gallons of fuel that are pre-positioned, ready to go in the Central Pacific. That means you got to fill that with something else. That means tankers. That means not oilers, not Navy oilers, not military seal of command oilers, but commercial oilers, or commercial tankers. And you have U.S. tankers under attack by people who think we should be 100% dependent on foreign companies to move our goods. Remember, Russia's in that same position. While I can't imagine us being sanctioned by other nations for our actions around the world, but now it's not governments that are sanctioning, it's corporations that are sanctioning. And so what happens if US tanker companies sanction the United States and you can't move your oil? This goes back to the resignation of the superintendent at Kings Point. This is a critical appointment right now. We need somebody in there who's got a foresight for what's happening. We still don't have a maritime administrator. That appointment is still head up. There's no direction for Marad out there. And I think we really need to start thinking about what is going to happen here with the US maritime industry in the future. Let's go ahead and go to story number five. All right, we've been talking about some dark subjects here on this episode of What the Ship. We're talking about Russia Ukraine war, we're talking about global economic crisis. Uh, we're talking about congressional investigations. We're even talking about the, the, the resignation of a superintendent of the U.S. March Marine Academy over potential sexual assault, sexual harassment issues at the academy. But for story number five, I always like to pick something that I find interesting. And this story <laughs> hits it right in the board, on, the, on the bullseye for me. Uh, Mike Schiller wrote this story, incident video, dinghy operator nearly run over by container ship in Southampton. I was a licensed merchant mariner. I sailed, I was a mate. So got up to my second mate, unlimited tonnage license, limited, uh, unli uh, limited master's license. And I can't tell you the amount of people who like to play chicken with large vessels. 
Uh, usually they're in sailboats, but every now and then they'll be in a different form of transportation, a jet ski, a dinghy. That's peanut, by the way, back there. So, so that's peanut. So anyway, there are multiple people who like to play chicken with large vessels. Uh, sailboats are most notorious for this for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is they'll sit there and say, well, you know, I'm sail powered, therefore I have the right of way. Yeah, that's true, except for one trump card in the rules of the road, which is constrained by draft. Deep draft vessels can't get out of the channel and move. They also can't stop very fast because they're big vessels. And for some reason, some reason that, that really defies imagination, People like to tempt fate by crossing in front of large, massive vessels that can't stop. And not only can they not stop, but at the very back end of them, they have the largest Cuisinart ever invented that's designed to chop your body up into small, little, tiny, chum-sized pieces. And we see it right here at Southampton in England. Now, granted, this dinghy operator got himself in, in a bit of trouble, uh, as the story says, according to local reports, the man was among a group of three people uh, recreating in a pair of dinghies. I don't know why people recreate dinghies, but they do in Southampton water when they found themselves in the path of a 400 meter long Al Zubaya, which was a, uh, I, I believe it's a hop hog ship. Unfortunately, as they went to move out of the way, one of the dinghy's engines failed, forcing its operator to jump in the water and try to swim to safety. Video of the incident was captured by passengers on board a passing ferry. Thankfully, the person in the water was able to escape and eventually rescued by the port of Southampton uh, patrol boat. So let me be clear, uh, don't take chances with this, but let's go ahead and play the video here and, and let it see. See the dinghy right there and you can see the head kind of bobbing. There you go, there he is, swimming for his life for a good reason. I, I thought the uh, uh, vessel here did a great job of almost running down a dinghy, which is, which is pretty impressive. Now understand, you're going to get pushed when this happens yeah, by a wall of water. This in. thing is displaced uh, yeah. probably about 100,000 oh tons, if not more, of water out from it. Uh, he is swimming for his life, trying to swim perpendicular to the vessel to get away, again, from the from the man-chopping machine and the very stern, stern end of this vessel, so you don't get pulled in and sucked in and chopped to pieces. Again, I, I, I don't know why people do this. I don't know why you would take chances uh, of being here. I also don't know why the people in the other dinghy didn't come get him uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, you can see him being fished up uh, out of the water here. Uh, at this point, understand the dinghy can get sucked in too. Uh, this is a big, huge, massive mach machine. This vessel is kind of light loaded. It doesn't have the full uh, 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 containers on it. So part of that prop is probably a little bit exposed. But I have a feeling that person in his dinghy uh, will never again risk himself or his dinghy to get in the front of a vessel leaving Southampton ever again. You only do that once and, and you will you'll realize it, it's a bad position to put yourself in your dinghy in. Yeah, I know I'm saying that a lot, but it's kind of funny. All right, on this episode of What the Ship, we covered the bases. Uh, every week, I wonder if we're gonna have enough material and information to, to go over. And man, not disappointed. I uh, want to thank all the new sites I hit. I don't get a chance to do that enough, but I appreciate it. And uh, if you hadn't done so, and I didn't mention it at the beginning of the video, please subscribe. Go ahead, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos. When they come out, leave a comment, give it a thumbs up. I usually ask for people to subscribe to my Patreon, but instead, with the conflict going on in Russia and Ukraine, please, please, if you can, if you could spare some money, uh, give it to Ukraine uh, relief agencies. Uh, there are nearly a million uh, displaced people, refugees coming out of Ukraine right now. It is a tragic, tragic story. Uh, Ukrainian mariners are leaving ships right now. Ukrainians make up 4.5% of the world's mariners trying to get home, find out about their families. Uh, we're, we're seeing just a, a horrific event unfold on TV, social media, right in front of us. And the implications of this is going to be felt by everybody around the planet. But remember, the economic impact you feel pales in comparison to the impact that's being felt by those in Ukraine and in Russia. So for myself and Peanut, this is Sal signing off. Peanut was not excited about our stories today. Sorry. <laughs>